Blog Talk Radio. Here at ACO Radio, American Communications Online, or any affiliated stations or websites are not responsible for what guests, hosts, or call-ins may say. All programming is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. Hello, world. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio, and this is Teresa J. Morris, live on the air. And I'm happy to tell you that we are going to have Ken Johnston today, Ralph Kennedy Johnston Sr. with us today, and uh, hopefully next Saturday as well. And uh, today, R.T. Knight, which is Richard Thomas Knight, who has gotten this year to be our co-host, and he's been very good at helping and prompting us and learning all the ins and outs of how to help with the run a radio station. So uh, right now, uh, I've got Richard here, but uh, I'm going to have – we had Ken on here, and we had a little technical difficulty. So, uh, Richard, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, talk for a moment, and, and I will go get, see what's up with Ken, okay? Go ahead. All right. Good evening, everyone. Put you online. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can get Richard's attention. I got you on the conference. Can you hear? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Richard, can you hear us? I can hear you. You had me muted when I was supposed to be speaking. Yeah. (laughs) This is Ken. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine, Ken. (laughs) I'm sorry. Go ahead. Now I'll just keep my mouth shut. (laughs) All right. Uh, Interestingly, uh, we had a little complication, but we've got it figured out. You know, sometimes, folks, things don't roll out perfect as we think they will. So uh, let's see how I can do this. Uh, uh, Okay, Richard, you go ahead and introduce yourself, please. My name is Richard T. Knight, and uh, I've been involved with the metaphysical, supernatural, and paranormal world for probably since birth. I'm 65 years young. Um, I have doctorates in divinity, theology, religious science, and metaphysics. Um, I've been helping TJ now with the program, and we have the delight of having all kinds of different topics under our spirituality and metaphysical productions. Um, We also have the Ascension Church Ohana, which is a spiritual church that welcomes everybody, including extraterrestrials. So uh, that's unique in in and of itself. Um, I've been on radio for about 10 years now, off and on, different uh, co-hosts and so forth, and I have the great pleasure of working now with uh, Teresa J. Morris. And uh, I welcome our new guests, um, Mr. Kennedy Johnston. Take it away, okay? (laughs) Ralph Kennedy Johnston Sr. And uh, Ken is who we all know him as, and I guess that's what they called him when he was a little boy. But Ken has known me for quite some time. Uh, I would say we met back when we all lived in Houston. And this is going to be a little conversation we're going to have. We thought we were had it all fixed up for today. Turned out it was set up for next Saturday, so we're going to do next Saturday too. But Ken is the boss of our little group we started. And let me start off here, Ken, for this. It says, uh, to my dear friend, Teresa J. Morris, this is just the beginning of the ACO and me, exclamation point. <laughs> so Ken and I met again. Uh, we had been talking, and he had been on my radio show for years, and then years on this BTR channel as well as revolution radio so uh i'm no longer with revolution as of uh january 19 2020 but uh ken we're gonna get you back going here we've all got 2020 behind us now and you know we want to build america again the way that we want to but you know groups are getting together 
and helping each other. And we are the baby boomers. But what's unique about you is you have worked as a wonderful, I would say, poster boy for not just the Boy Scouts and uh, military schools and being a Marine and then going to NASA and helping uh, in a lot of places like an engineer, but you were a pilot. And we're going to talk about when you were young and start right at the beginning of the book that I am so impressed with because it's perfect. It's the perfect book. You've got all the all the beautiful pictures of all your, yourself at NASA in space gear and all the – I remember these uh, – oh, so much of this is – these patches that are in your book. So if you will, I'd like you to start uh, in the beginning. You've got a beautiful radio voice for those that don't know, and we've got a lot of new listeners. But you worked with Grumman Aerospace Corporation and then how you wound up at NASA. But uh, I want people to get this book, Ken's Moon. And let's talk about ACO and what we're doing with you. How did you get started writing this book? But let's start in Oklahoma. No, let's start Sam Houston when you were born. So let's go back, if you don't mind, and do this is going to be your story of origin, and we'll move oh. forward. Okay. Uh, if you're ready for it, <laughs> be quite interesting. Some of it is. Uh, no, I was born at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, uh, Texas, back in 1942, which puts me older than most of you people listening in. But um, my my dad was a captain in the Army Air Corps, and uh, he served his time and. Just a couple of months after, uh, three or four months after I was born, he he was he lost his life during World War II. So I kind of grew up that way with my mother and uh, with several stepdads. So any of you out there that have, are, are stepchildren or have been that, then you know what it can be like. And it it is winds up usually what what you make of it the best you can. Anyway, so um, I wound up um, being the stepson of T.C. Ray and and the little panhandle town called Hart, H-A-R-T, Hart, Texas. And once I got um, up to junior high, I applied up to the Oklahoma Military Academy because I wanted to be like a be a, a military guy like my dad, you know. And of course, um, four years there and graduating from high school and then junior college and becoming um, a um, well, I was a cadet major. But then um, then I went to the to the, the little twist to the the religious side, becoming a Baptist uh, minister and working at Oklahoma City University where I, I got my uh, Ph.D. in the Doctorate of Metaphysics. So that's, gosh, those are decades ago. I used to track that they were only years ago, but now, folks, it's, it's decades. And um, when I went to work at NASA, that's uh, with Grumman as a pilot, and they, they brought me in as a spacecraft test pilot for the lunar module, since Grumman was the builder of the um, Apollo lunar, uh, lunar spacecraft. So I, I had the privilege of working hand in uh, hand on hand with the uh, all the astronauts, and later on was considered civilian. We were considered civilian astronauts because we were the ones that were in the vacuum chambers doing the testing and making everything work right, so we could go to the moon and get credit for that. So that brought it, you know, in the meantime, you know, in your spare time when you're doing things, naturally, more of you folks that are making your contribution to the world and society, such as uh, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and, um, oh gosh, just about every youth organization I had the privilege of, of working with. And I still am connected to the cadets um, with, the, um, uh, with, the, with the Air Force. So I'm, I'm still active. I'm, <laughs> I may be older than some of you might think, but you figure it out yourself, 1942 to current time so we can take it from there uh, tj and uh let's see if i can't hopefully i can bring something and add something to it based upon just the experience and past opportunities and things that i've been involved in so and it's still going it is still going. we're just now we are just now moving into the phase of direct contact with extraterrestrials and that's a good part that i think i'm ready for how about that one that's wonderful and Fran helen marshall johnston also worked for the government, and maybe in the future uh, she'll come on, but uh, we're going to let uh, Ken be the star of the show today because uh, Fran's been a friend of mine for years on Facebook, 
And she is an excellent uh, woman, uh, professional, and uh, she actually has run a lot of events herself. And she does prize horse shows, but they're both quite accomplished in America, and I'm very pleased that they are my social media friends. And uh, and I have had the pleasure of meeting Ken and uh, his brother back in the day, and that's because my husband worked at NASA, and I had been inducted into the government in 1967, and so I was a hostess. I was an ambassador of goodwill, and we're going to get into all of how these things happen because it's quite an interesting yarn and a story, like Ken said, all the way up to uh, who we are now and why the old timers are coming out and talking. Now, it's going to be interesting because down here, Mr. Hoagland, I believe, was the one that came down and helped start here in Gulf Breeze where I am with others and uh getting the UFO business going when we had a sighting down here that was real, but that turned into some stuff too in Pensacola. But I want to share that the Blue Angels are, this is the home of the Blue Angels, but Ken actually learned, did you not how to fly? Didn't you fly planes down here in Pensacola? Can we share that of uh, you <laughs> going the Marines? Well, a little over five, almost 6,000 hours, if you want to call it a couple hours, uh, yes, I was a flight instructor um, in um, in the Marine Corps jets and then uh, with NASA spacecraft, uh, whatever you want to call it. I've, I was blessed with the opportunity to be part of it, and, and really it was because of uh, wanting to be like my dad and and be a pilot and uh, and take the memory I have of that I was taught about my father. In fact, that I'm looking at a picture of him and my mother. Uh, with my mother's holding all three of us kids, and I'm the baby at the time, so that'd be 1942. I'll, I'll go with a second. Anyway, so that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, we've we've had the opportunity to be a part of go, getting mankind on the moon, and what we did to get there. I helped write procedures of the activities we did on in the lunar module. So once we got on the moon, how to get in and out and how to stay alive and then how to get launched again back up to the command module. All those were part of the group organization that I was with, with the Grumman Corporation. So I've been blessed with being at the right place at the right time and hopefully did the right thing. Now, A.R. Johnston, your brother, and I'm looking at a picture. Now, the vacuum chamber airlock uh and all of these things that I saw uh, people in and out of in the simulators. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about your history there because my husband working there, and I, you've got a picture of the original. There's so much to cover, folks, to really do it right because uh, you'd have to have lived it. And that's why I like Ken so much, helping our Authors Club online and being our leader for our uh, veterans uh, in his retirement now because he is – uh, got so much. He and his wife both have so much experience. But uh, he's been w- really helping the Civil Air Patrol in New Mexico, and uh, he's on my phone right now with me. And I'm just so impressed the fact that you've got so many merits of award, and how you have been. Gosh, such a wonderful person. Even the Masons. I just want to mention a few things, folks, because he's accomplished what a lot of people only dream about doing at NASA. And you'd have to have been there to understand that everything he did is quite an accomplishment. A lot of engineers and my uh, husband worked directly for NASA and was hired by Chris Kraft. And then his hus- his daddy, uh, Don, who is deceased now, but growing up, worked at Grumman. And uh, at the time, uh, Ken, uh, before you went for the National Press Conference, you went as uh, – did you have – as a spokesperson when you went before the National Press Club in Washington in the UFO business, folks, this was a really big deal. So uh, we're going to talk about everything that we can, but mixing in Hoagland here in Gulf Breeze – and then uh, he was looking forward to getting your pictures. Now, you want to talk about uh, – I don't know how much of your history you're willing to go through because, folks, uh, we're, we've got a book called Ken's Moon, Revealing the Dark Mission of NASA. But 
at the time, Ken was, uh, you may have heard of Car- Carol Rosen and working with Werner von Braun. And it was a really big deal when we got to see Werner von Braun. And I was in at one of the meetings where Ken was sitting in the back and there's something was broken or something in the back. But uh, Ken was in the back of the uh, stadium, or not the stadium, in the room. Was that building one, Ken? You remember? Yeah, where we was, go ahead. That's the auditorium. The auditorium in building one. And so, yeah, I had to step in and help them out and get, get the, all that good fun stuff working so that um, Dr. Uh, Werner von Braun could be listened to. About that, right? Yeah. Yes, that's great. And also, I've got a picture of you here with Buzz Aldrin later. And Buzz Aldrin, folks, is a very famous astronaut that actually got to leave off the planet. And we saw many, many pilots. And my group is the pilots around the world, uh, professional pilots as well, including Ralph Rodenhag, that they haven't been flying. And it's been, we want to help the pilots too. So it's all the people that are seniors now that uh, a lot of them are still having to work, and they're just not making a lot of money like my starving musicians. So we're going to try to bring a little light on all this. But, Ken, uh, now, how did you – you were a speaker by 2006 after the uh, – well, let's start right there. People may know that you came into fame because you were able to speak up and willing to – Add your voice to the choir that they were looking for with uh, Stephen Bassett. Do you remember in 2006? And then that's when Buzz Aldrin, the picture you have with him, uh, Buzz Aldrin well, then. And, yeah. Um, I didn't know whether you wanted to go all, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> all the way back to um, uh, the religious side of things and being involved with Worldwide Church of God and being uh, in charge okay. of the vocal, vocal department. And then uh, later moving on, well, no, I, 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 that'll cover it right there. I was born and raised um, a very strong um, Christian and um, um, and still am. So, you know, in fact, that, that's one of the most interesting parts of being involved in the space program is, is knowing the fact that uh, we are part of God's creation, and um, those that won't accept that, that's fine. You can accept it. If you don't, then you can just keep coming along with us too, and we'll we'll, we'll take you take you back to where we want to go, and that's uh, the space program. So, um, I'm not sure how far back you want me to go, uh, TJ, but uh, it's been a, a real blessing to be a part of it. So, uh, <laughs> did, did I not talk long enough here, and I, and I let you drop off? That happens sometimes. <clears throat> So, as far as I, I am concerned, I, go ahead. I like the fact that, that America knows you step forward with your voice in the UFO community. And uh, that's how we wound up with this book. And there's a long story that a lot of you may not know about. But uh, while Ken happened to be working, he was a, a wonderful uh, pilot. And in his book, there's pictures of him in the, his space, actually space uniform, and then his uh, ja- uh, jumpsuit. And uh, we've got all naval school pre-flight, uh, all the proof you would need to show who he is and what he did in this. And uh, the reason this book, I think, came to about being was because he got involved as a spokesperson back in the day, they actually called it like a, uh, well, he he joined Hoagland, and Hoagland wanted to see some pictures that Ken had. But Ken, uh, you want to talk about those pictures? That, that, uh, those pictures and that Hoagland wanted to see? Yeah, so, I am. Um... One, one of my duties, yeah, one of my duties and things was with the data and photo control department, which I was the director of at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, and my responsibility was to be sure that all the scientists around the world got their samples of, of lunar material samples, as well as the photographs of the samples as they lay on the lunar surface, as well as once they were brought to the laboratory at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, and um produce all of that information for him. So I was, that was my duty. I had a pretty good sized, important job as far as scientists were concerned around the world. And um, so I wound up uh, working with Richard Hoagland because he was, uh, 
invited down to the launch uh, of a couple of the um, spacecraft, and he and I got to, to know each other at um, not Oklahoma. Excuse me, I've got it. I have moved around so many times, folks, uh, such as Houston, and, and then I'm close to Albuquerque, New Mexico, right now, up in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Richard Hoagland was putting on a conference there, and I came in and wanted to um, say hello to him just to meet him, and I gave the the people that were taking the tickets at the front my ID card, and the woman stepped back. She said, oh, you're who we've been looking for, <laughs> and kind of scared me a little bit, took me down in front of everybody and took me up on the stage and, and said, Richard, said, Richard, we found him. Here he is. And so the, that's how I wound up working with Richard. Uh, for quite a few years and going to uh, a few launches at the Cape as well as getting him in contact with all the right people that I knew by my pleasure of being part of the, the, the team that put us on the moon and that has put us in space and that um, who knows where at all we've been in contact with and what all we've been in contact with. So uh, it's been a very interesting life to this point, and I still think I have a whole lot longer to go and hopefully a whole lot more to contribute to the program. So you just keep asking the questions, and I'll see if I can't find the answers. Will all that right. work? Well, uh, let's let's talk a little about about how all these. Do you remember Grumman and uh, what all you did at Grumman? Because people may be interested. Because JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they hear JPL a lot in the UFO right. business. But the reason I'm saying UFO people is for unidentified flying object, but we've pretty much grown into another phase after 2020 into unidentified anomalous phenomena. And uh, other people can, may call it unidentified aerial phenomena, but uh, we're doing our best to graduate into after 2020 where we're going to have things flowing forward as alien civilizations exist. And Ken, having lived through all this with me and others, we remember the feeling of going to space and having that all-American feeling of we're all working together to get us in space where we actually feel like we came from anyway. And working for Martin Marietta, and uh, these were corporations like we still have today, and uh, they would help get us into space, including the aftermath after the Challenger. And I believe uh, Ken's uh, brother, A.R., had worked at a couple of the locations, including the one with White, because your cousin came on here one time in the past and talked about that and how important that was. And it's in your book, too. And that was about the O-ring, if I remember correctly, the weather and cold and all that. We lost some some astronauts. Do you remember that? That story was oh, yeah. really big. You, you, you pushed the right button finally and, and brought that one up. Uh, the, the O-rings, which were the connections between the, the big Saturn V launch vehicles going from the, the main rocket, then you're going to the, the single engine rocket to get you further and up, and then you get into the command module, and you'll have the rockets involved in there. But, but um we, uh, when we were doing the testing, we lost um, all three astronauts there on the launch platform because of um, the uh, the O ring around the main uh, the fuel engines, the fuel going to the engines. The when when the they were doing a test firing of it, getting ready. Actually, they got the whole crew on board and we were getting ready to do the final testing, and they they fueled up the uh, the third stage. The first, actually, the first stage, which was all a big rocket, and um, when they fired that engine, the O-ring that connected the fuel tanks section of it to the upper section melted away, and then it it burned through and it exploded and just it ripped all the way up, um, and it killed all all three of the astronauts that were involved in that: Gus Grissom, Roger uh, Roger Chafee, and Ed White. It's amazing how you can remember things like that that hit so close to your heart. And um, so yeah, that's um, that's that's I was there at the time. Now my brother, Dr. A. R. Johnston, he was a, a government uh, employee. I was with with Grumman, but he was with with NASA, and uh, he was he was in in charge of the testing at the vacuum chambers and um, at the Johnson Space Center. So once I got out of the Marine Corps, 
I, his attitude with me since I was a pilot and all, he says, get your family down here to Houston because we need people like you guys. Because they were, they were just starting to build up NASA at the time. So I walked in at the right time. And fortunately, I had, a, had the blessing of having a brother that was involved. And he pointed me in the right direction. And I got to meet the right people, even Vaughn and Von Braun, and become part of, of the team of getting us to the moon. And that's, uh, that's, that was kind of fascinating that I can now look back and say, yes, we were, we were there. We did part of that, and we're looking forward to our landing on Mars. Uh, <clears throat> that's if we haven't already done that, and we'll talk about that sometime too, TJ. Okay. okay. Yeah, I remember the uh, picture with all that heavy equipment on, and it was like my husband had to carry an 85-pound rucksack to be like special forces. You know, in right. the army, but you uh, that backpack because a lot of people don't know all that equipment has to be tested out. And A.R. Borden, uh, A.R. Borden, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Uh, that's <laughs> a whole nother story of reality between me and Ken and Karen Kirkpatrick. Oh my gosh, any <laughs> Ken and I have a lot of friends that do events, folks, and uh, some of them were in the UFO business. Some of them were in the spiritual business, and some were in the metaphysical business. So those are key words. In uh, you may say Fortean for Charles Fort are uh, metaphysical. So I'm, you know, if I get into the areas that are my thing, I loved NASA, and I loved going down NASA Road One and my Jag XKE convertible with my top down and all the. Uh, Astronauts, especially ones in the Corvettes with the bat wing, they'd flirt with me. And, uh, you know, it was just nice. It was so nice. And so I got to hear how we had UFOs in space, but we didn't say that. In the typing pool, the girls, they weren't allowed to talk about it either. And so my husband called me up to listen to that. But I looked up to all the people doing their jobs there, but back in the 1960s, what we're talking, what we lived through and were there was how we kept secrets because we just didn't talk about what we really did know about and uh, the engineers. And so there's some stories here to tell. And Richard Allen Miller has one as well. Dr. Richard Allen Miller works with us. And we're going to have a great team of working together with Ken and writing these books that Ken has spent years putting together he came on my radio shows before he had it and then uh, brett cullen shepherd and karen patrick had been on my radio shows and then worked with uh him and ken went and helped them but ken let's go back on the storyline with the ufos because you've been a marine and uh you're a journalist and a historian now and you want to tell people on october 2nd you will be 78, is that correct? Uh, 1942, up until now, I think that's correct. I, I don't want to count up the dates anymore because I get confused. Well, this is a very excellent-looking flat top, tight, high and tight, at the U.S. <laughs> Naval School in your flight. Uh, you're in your flight suit. First airplane I soloed in. That is awesome. Folks, I wished I had all the pictures my mother had of me growing up. Now, I also see a spacecraft pilot, L.M. Log. You've got that picture in there uh, in your yeah, book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a little over, well, over, over 2,000 hours as the, uh, the command, well, the lunar module pilot. Uh, so I, I was used to step in for the astronauts and test everything and be sure it was good and safe and operating good before we put them in it and put them in the vacuum chambers. And then they got to test it that way. But no, that, um, that was my job. And uh, it was a real privilege of being a part of that. So, and I'm looking for my copy of that book that you're referring to, but I enjoyed <laughs> writing that. <laughs> how, how heavy was that backpack? Say that again, please. How heavy when you had to go in that little circle to get in, and it was cumbersome, I remember that. And I know uh, one time they had some troubles here and there, but I'm looking at you in this huge spacecraft. You look, uh, I mean, in this big space suit, and it's you uh, in a space shuttle suit. But what do you remember having to stand up with that big backpack on your back? 
I sure do. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you're <clears throat> when you're testing out the um, spacesuits in the vacuum chambers, honey, you're doing it in one Earth gravity. So you're talking about more than an extra hundred pounds that you put on. And when you've got the um, uh, the backpack, as we called it, and that's the the oxygen uh, in, in uh, that you <laughs> that you inside the uh, yeah, you know, the backpack it, oh, you, on your shoulders. Once you have your spacesuit on and you have the full pressure in it, that helps support and hold a lot of the uh, the vacuum chambers. Not by excuse me, the um, the oxygen tanks and things on your back it makes it a little bit easier. But then you you have to be able to walk and overcome the pressure holding your your spacesuit together. So you're you're kind of inside there, and then to have to be able to take steps and walk in, in Earth at one Earth gravity, it, it's tight. But uh, no, I was young and strong and uh, at the right place at the right time to do that stuff. So um, that, that's the picture on the front of my book, Ken's Moon. That's a picture of me inside the vacuum chamber, um, getting ready to go in with the spacesuit on. Then I had to put the helmet on and uh, inside the, the the doors. Let's see, uh, what do we call that? You go inside one doors and then you get your spacesuit turned on good and or good, and then they depressurize. The, to down to the vacuum chamber level, and then we could go on in there, up the uh, the staircase to get into the front door of the lunar module, and uh, we had to do all of this stuff. Is ten to the minus twelve? Those who are mathematic figured out ten to the minus twelve tor. That's how that's one one molecule of oxygen about every cubic foot. <laughs> that gives you some idea of how much oxygen there is if you if you lose your spacesuit and you get a hole in it. But we did. We did the testing and it got all that stuff working good, and um, away we went. That was part of it. What was ECS? Do you remember what is EC? Ken Johnson, Gemini suit ECS changeover test. Was the ECS stand for something special, or oh, did you, would you remember? Environmental Control System ECS. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I never used one. I didn't know what that acronym was. <laughs> I'm sorry, my dogs are coming in from the other part of there. It's a little background noise. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, yay. We'll stand by for just a moment, Ken, while they walk through. Those are your little baby German shepherds. Uh, The tram just got them back outside, so we're good. Okay. Well, uh, would Fran like to speak? Is she around? Does she want to say anything? I didn't even ask her. Okay. She, well, this, maybe next this, Saturday, if that's okay. We, that'd be great. Okay. Now, your lunar module now, that was built and tested by Grumman, but she knows a lot about it, too, and the flag on the moon from Apollo 15 crew. Do you remember? My husband got one. I remember. I thought that was so cool. Do you, did you get one? As a, uh, Some people got one of the uh, souvenir we, flags. Do you remember? Well, what? What you're talking about is the beta cloth. The cloth material is made from fiberglass because that's that's what would would not burn, and we were concerned about. It. And we did have that problem once, but uh, inside the spacecraft, because it, originally it was 100% oxygen, and later we found out we could operate with a, a pressurized with a oxygen and air, regular air that we needed. But the problem there of in the vacuum chambers, we had to be sure that we could. Um, uh, get the right, the right air in the right place. So that's that's where those of us that were um, experienced with pressure doing space, not space, in our pressure garments and jets and um, being sure that we, uh, we can keep enough oxygen and pressure on our blood systems to survive, then we would, with NASA, we were able to uh, wear the spacesuits and do the same testing. So uh, when you've got the suit on, you're, you're fighting against the pressure and the the, wow. joint, the joints in in the waist and the knees and and in the chest we we actually have a a um, uh, it's it's a fiberglass torso that will hold the pressure inside but it's it's hard as a rock and then of course the shoulders and the arms are all connected to that as well as the waist and your legs below and then your your helmet off and that's all connected to the the um, the, the torso of the chest and stuff. I'll think of the name of it in a minute. You're, you're taking me back to the days of when I put my pants on, lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, that's the kind of things people, you know, it's uh, personal, and they didn't get to do it, and it's things that, you know, you wonder about, you know, because we didn't have to do it, and there was so much extensive training, and I remember watching, coming and going and watching the guys, even in the test that sliding jet thing in the seat when they'd test that across out there, you know, uh, at Johnston. If, I don't know if you remember that seat or not, but they'd zap it. It was, yeah, we watched mm-hmm. people do a lot of strange things, folks. We really did. So to me, it's all interesting, Ken, you know, so just trying to help you remember uh, thumbing through, you know, your book. Uh, I'm looking right now. I like the Mason stuff now. Some people don't understand, you know, different groups. And this is something later on we can get in with Richard uh, once he gets to know you a little better, too, to help us uh, next weekend. Is You had a certificate in a lodge as a 32-degree Mason. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that or not, or uh, worshipful. Master, because we are working with the uh, time uh, ascension age now, so that is mainly what I'm promoting and marketing. But, you know, Ken, we've got to be about space and getting people to the other side that have lived and died, and it's all coming together with space and spirit. But the Masons were always in my life, and uh, it's one of many groups. And for some reason, you were able to get involved with that, and, uh, you know, now that you're retired from all that. But would you just sort of mention, because in America, that was uh, all the people that were in America that were men that went to church and worked around NASA, they wore Masonic Lodge rings. Didn't you get the 32 degree? Can you, are you allowed to talk about any of that? Um, I'll talk about whatever I can talk about. Uh, The Masonic organization, which goes back ancient times in in Europe and was brought over into America by our, our ancestors that that made the jump from Europe to, uh, to America. And then we brought it up from, brought it up from there. But, um, no, I, as, as a youth, I was part of the Demolay, which was um, kind of the, the foreground. And then when I got old enough to, to become a Mason, then I became a Mason. And by working my way up through there, I became the, the um, um, I wanted to say command module. I don't know why, how you switched me back out of, out of the, the spacecraft to the Demolay. And then to, oh, and then, so all of those different groups and organizations, I had the opportunity of, of working with the folks and the people that, that have, and they're, they're wonderful people, and they usually are quite quiet or silent about how much effort the Masons and things do for our society and uh, to, to keep things going. So you also have religious groups that are totally anti um male organizations or what have you. So you you, you got to be sure that uh, if, if people have a, an attitude towards masonry, go do your research and find out. You'll find out that they're responsible for a lot of the good stuff that you have for you right now. So now I've, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of doing that and working up to the 33rd degree, which is as high as you can possibly go. And then so what do you do? You get retired. That's why I jokingly say I'm retarded. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm retired, right? Well, I see the Scottish Rite Mason. I know you got the 32nd degree, and you actually got proficiency at that. And that's about the time you moved to Seattle, and you and friend worked also with the 4-H. I was in the 4-H myself, and I was in the right. Girl Scouts, and my mother ran all of that. So, you know, we can talk about your involvement in the community as well and the Imperial Council of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. And what is that about? That's a very curious-looking certificate in North yeah. America. Is that another community, or is that Masons, or is that me- it, metaphysics? It's interesting. You have, to, you have to be a Mason to become a uh, Scottish writer, not what it is. Um, it's been a long time to be a part of that, but they are oh. more of the, the public. They're the ones that the parades and uh, youth groups and stuff like that. They, they they do all kinds of wonderful things to help our society and our youth and the kids growing up. So, uh, whereas the the Masonic order is um, a little more personal and private, but it it 
it teaches anyone to to be faithful and do the right things and uh, uh, be more moral than what our societies have gotten to be in many cases. But, so they, they they have very good things. And, of course, with anything and all things, you're going to have strangers and strange people come in and try to mess things up. But uh, I, I still believe strongly, and I have a doctorate degree in metaphysics and in religion, so uh, I'm very strong on supporting the these groups for the good that they do for society and people. So um, you can take it from there. Well, I appreciate you working with uh, everybody <laughs> and uh, how you were able to come forward in so many groups and still be involved with Richard and bringing these pictures forward. And uh, I want to talk a little about your badges, too, for the Solar System Ambassador before we reach the top of the hour. Do you remember your Solar System ID badge? Uh, it's Solar System Ambassador. It's got your picture on it. And, uh, of course, you're still Solar System Ambassador, from, but we have 2007 and 2004. 2009, uh, five. So uh, now, was that through a particular company? Do I need to look that up because I'm looking at the pictures. But uh, do you remember, or can you talk about that? The Solar System well, Ambassador I, badges. You, I, I'm just. Uh, <clears throat> if they haven't come up and told me, do not discuss this, do not say that. Um, then I had to hear that. But since no one's told me, it, I can't talk about stuff. I, I have no problems about discussing it. Solar System, uh, and I'm, I'm, I found the book, and I'm trying to get, what page do you want? 238. 238? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that will okay. help help joggle your mind, uh, 238. Okay. And uh, no I think we'll get Richard involved with us once we get into talking about what we all plan on doing in the future together. But let's start with the Solar System Ambassador. And it says Dr. Ken Johnston, but I want to know who gave you those in, uh, because uh, JPL and then uh, I'm trying to uh, – it says you went to the Mars Society Conference and Houston. I made lots of friends. The world was enjoying experiencing civilian astronaut consultant pilot and dreamed of going to Mars. Mars One announced that. Uh, oh goodness, they had 2,002, 202,586 people that applied. I think you became a PR person with Mars One and with marketing and promoting, and then we've got you in a space suit here right there with the Solar Ambassador. Yeah, if you want to look at 237, that's a great picture of you. Uh, you actually put in and made it except you were a senior Right for the in Mars One, we have a whole group, folks. That uh, another whole group we can market and promote with uh, Ken and Mars, and he likes to talk about that. But you know what I'm talking about, Ken? We're going to talk I, about I getting into the space. Is we just moved everything around, and I can't find my copy of that book. I was looking at an earlier version of it uh, called Ken's New and the Autobiography, and I so I can't. You know, oh, you may not have it. the one I've got. Yeah. I don't. That's my problem. Right now. Well, let's and just see if you're if you can recall it, because uh, sometimes you were asked to teach and work with Houston and Grumman Aerospace and then public relations work, and at the same time, uh, somebody gave you that position uh, for marketing and public relations. And made you an ambassador for our solar system. In that, folks, that'd be in the space race genre that we're talking about. So, for those of you that may not know, we even had one. <laughs> Some people may think it's not real, Ken, and that was another reason you wrote your book because you lived it, right? Space orbital flight, and we actually had a space race with the Russians and getting yeah. into space. So this was a really, really big deal to have Ken involved in uh, supplying and how he became a journalist and historian off the record, uh, protecting what he could uh, with all the mystery shrouding around a lot of pictures 
about the moon and getting into the UFO business and how he met Von Braun uh, being in the business that he was in providing film coverage, speaker coverage. And do you remember that position you had when I uh, met yes. you? And I was, uh, I was, I was the director of the data, the data and photo control department at the LRL, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. So I was um, involved in every single sample that was brought back from the moon by each one of the missions. And um, I was in charge of the group that would have them uh, after they went through the assembly lines and were processed and put inside of special containers and things. And we had scientists from all over the world that had requested various types of samples. And then the group I had working under me were the ones that we would uh, package up everything, put them in special shipping containers, and then they would be forwarded uh, to these individuals all around the world. So we got everybody involved in, in our, our lunar uh, landing missions. Uh, so that was as as I said, the little small little group I had, I had uh, four uh, secretaries that did the, uh, the typing and writing up of the reports that the various scientists at the Lunar City Laboratory would write up on each sample that they would they would test and, and certify and verify. And um, my clerical staff would take their writing <laughs> as best they could and put them into documents. And then when they would request their samples. We would have a documented uh, report on each each piece that was brought back from the moon. So that was that was one of my responsibilities. I had that was after we did the, the Apollo 11 landing, and once we landed Apollo 11 on the moon, um, I went over to um, uh, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory and just picked up the regular astronauts that came back from the first flight, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and, and Jack Schweikert. Um, well, they were going through um, being decontaminated, if you want to call it that, to be sure, 21 days to be sure they didn't bring back any viruses or um, anything that could go wild on planet Earth with all the oxygen and stuff. So once that was all tested and taken care of, they were on their own, and then we were able to process the samples and get those out to the scientists and the different countries all around the world. So I was right there in the middle of all this one stuff. Now, you, you mentioned... Uh, Voner von Braun, um, I went to several meetings at the, the Building One, the big giant six-story building at the Johnson Space Center, and <clears throat> in the various conference meetings we would have, and von Braun was there, and I got to meet him personally and talk with him um, several times. So I, I was blessed at being pretty much in some of the right places at the right time, and, and sometimes in, in the worst places. So he's <laughs> TJ, you there? Hello, TJ. Ken, you still there? Hello. We seem to be having technical difficulties at the moment. Um, this is the live broadcast, of course, with our fantastic guest, um, Ralph Kennedy Johnston, uh, previous civil civil pilot and, and member of NASA, who basically helped with our space program when originally things were launched to the moon. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I'm sorry. We, we, we got dropped out. My apology. I'm back. Okay. Yes, I apologize well, too. You were uh, Richard. Where were we? Do you remember by chance? Um, Ken, do you remember anybody? Uh, Ken was talking about sending the samples all around the world to the scientists, and he'd also yeah. sp- uh, spoke about you know the other astronauts, Buzz and the rest of them, in regards to having great relations and you know everybody sharing communication and information and all that kind of thing. Okay. Well, okay. Good. Continue, Ken, and then maybe we can allow Richard to uh, assist us getting into some more metaphysical cause, and the spiritual and mixing it all together, uh, which is what we do here as an author club, in the, your next book, 
But go ahead, Ken, help us with that was very curious. When people got to see those things on TV, our moon rock kind of things, and then you were talking about Von Braun, uh, which you have a picture with Kennedy and him in your book. So uh, these are memories, folks, uh, bef- uh, before Kennedy was killed. That was President Kennedy. Uh, but they actually got to, you know, Kennedy and Von Braun actually got together. <laughs> And I've got some pictures that Ken doesn't have in his book where he was outside showing uh, you know, showing us walking and helping us. I, like I said, uh, PR ambassador helping people. Uh, I guess they're like leading a tour group is what I would call it. But I don't even know why you were there that day uh, with me. But let's talk about the rocks first and how you got into uh, helping film and uh they transferred you after you'd been a pilot and you'd been an astronaut and uh, you started working like with your brother and then you're also testing spaces because you're a test pilot and you and your brother both wanted to be uh, astronauts. But, you know, you take what you can get at the time. Isn't that right, Ken? Absolutely. And, um, well, you, you were, let's go back to Werner von Braun. Um, yeah. He, <clears throat> he was set in on, uh, almost all the different meetings that we had from the Lunar Receiving Laboratory and various scientists that would, would show up to, to pick up their particular samples. Uh, and that's I would, being the right, I say, at the right place and getting an opportunity to meet, meet all these different scientists and brilliant people from around the world. Here, I look at it from this standpoint. I, was, I, was, um, I may have had my, my doctor, no, no, I got my doctor degree later on, uh, but at least a college education, at least my military education and my, my rank and my, my testing, all of those things, um, they, they were of benefit in how to deal with people from all over the world. And because we had scientists from just about every country in the world, even from Russia, that would, would come in and had the pleasure of sitting in conference meetings with those folks as well. So uh, I guess it's just... It obviously was meant to be, and I was at the right place at the right time. So I, I'll I'll give credit to the unknown that well, put me there. I guess I was too, and I was with the advi- uh, ACAR. I had signed all my paperwork March tenth, nineteen sixty-seven. But uh, you know, the things that we talked about wasn't allowed to be talked about, much less the typing pool and. Now I think they've got movies out there with different little parts. But I later met J. Allen Hynek and got uh, about the time – I don't where were you? In, uh, I think you were back in Seattle with your wife, Fran, uh, by the time J, – J, JPL. Now, do, you, do you remember anything, Jet Propulsion Laboratory or Grumman or Rockwell, anything like that in your memories? Well, I was I was sent to uh, uh, JPL um, for a, a couple of meetings there and all, but I didn't I didn't get to get into their uh, I wouldn't call it the secret uh, station they had up on the fifth floor, but uh, um, I did have the privilege of working with those folks. So um, and nowadays it, it's if, if we're dealing if we're dealing with with Mars and uh, we find out that uh, JPL and uh, they may well have already been uh, involved with that part of the program. So there, there's still a whole lot of good stuff taking place. And those young people out there that are in school, you get your education, you get your training and experience, and check around, you'll find the right people, get you in the right place. Next thing you know, you may be walking around on Mars trying to figure out what we're going to do next there. Well, let's talk a little bit. How did you go to Switzerland and Poland? That wasn't time travel, was it? Uh, no, I was um, I was invited to come and speak at one of their conferences, and of course they paid all the way and back and forth for me to come and be a guest. I I went to their youth colleges and groups, and in, um, uh, in India, for one place, and um, we were doing just fine. And then told this particular individual <laughs> that they, for some reason, they tried to shut us down for bringing information public to the world, and uh, I got, uh, you mean to tell the story about how they got me, uh, almost got me killed? Uh, well, uh, can we go, 
Can we start with the uh, National Press Club and moving forward with all this UFO, you know, st- interstellar, and uh, how Richard Hoagland had his finger oh. on the pulse and with Mars and all of that. But yeah, however you want to put it together, it's your story. <laughs> Uh, well, we have to put it together by saying you need to get the book, and then you need to get a, a recording because it takes hours. Uh, now, Richard Richard C. Hoagland uh, was in Seattle, Washington, and he was holding a conference there. Um, and I was still at uh, with Grumman at the time, and I I knew that he was going to be discussing what we may have accomplished and what would, might have happened on Mars as well as on the moon. And so I went to the conference meeting that they had there in Seattle, uh, a huge place. I think there were hundreds of people. And I, I walked in and paid my little money, and I, I wrote a little note and handed it to the person giving me the ticket. I said, you might want to give this to Mr. Hoagland and tell him that, uh, you know, that I decided to come. They read, it, they read my name, and this is, this is scary. <laughs> Their eyes got big. They said, oh, my God, you're, you're who we've been looking for. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but um, – they went and Richard called me back uh, behind the stage and platform and put me on the front row and uh, we that's how he and I got started and then I had him come over to my home uh, and I was I was fortunate that I made copies of darn near everything and I had a big double door safe where I kept things in and um, these are, were copies of the reports that scientists made of the lunar samples and things that took place. And uh, I took him in and showed him. He said, you're, you're who we've been looking for. And I guess, again, I, I use the terms being at the right place at the right time with the right stuff. And that's kind of kind of what when I've gone places, people say, oh, you're him. And I go, oh, I'm in trouble again. So now it's it's been a blessing and a real experience to actually be in on the inside of the adventures and things that we've been trying to do to bring human society up to the level where we can deal with, and in my personal opinion, deal with direct contact to extraterrestrials. Would that put us right there? Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, uh, how folks he came across uh, getting into, I guess, the National Press Conference in Washington, D.C., he was allowed to say certain things and other things he had to keep classified. I don't know even... We weren't allowed to tell our wi- our husbands, wives. Uh, we actually were under contract, and most of us, 25 years to 50 years. So we're only just now releasing. And uh, there was a gentleman, M- Ronald Mallet, an astrophysics cosmologist in the field of cosmology. Uh, he's a very famous man of color. We can say black astrophysicist. And he uh, was working uh, as uh, a theoretical physicist, academic and author. So he came very close to uh, some of the same work in time travel uh, back in the day. And I don't know how far he's gotten now, but actually I happen to know a lot about that was going on and was asked to do a conference in Kentucky called the Pythagoras Conference. And Stuart Anderson was a big name back then, and a lot of people, but he went to India, and India was working on time travel, and Ken was working on time travel. But Ken wasn't allowed to talk about time travel, but his buddy, Andrew Bashago, was. And I got to meet Andrew Bashago at the Mars Conference in 2017 at the University of Southern Alabama. <laughs> Now, would you like to talk about anything you can remember about uh, time travel and any of the people that were doing conferences in Kentucky at the Pythagoras? Or uh, I don't think you came to that, and we were trying to get uh, Andrew with Stuart Anderson and, and I believe Ronald Mallett back then, and uh, Andrew may have even talked to him because I was in the Pegasus. Uh, group, uh, and that's one of the groups, a social media group that Andrew Bashago started. Uh, well, the thing is, with <clears throat> we um, we were when we had our top secret clearances, there was almost nothing we could talk about. 
all of that has been cleared, and it's opening up the, the doors for those of us that are still alive. That's the biggest problem. There's so many of those that were involved uh, are no longer here. Now, uh, Andy, or Andrew, Andrew Vachago, um, you know, he, he's, a, he's a legal attorney uh, and very sophisticated in that line, but he was um, given the opportunity for um, time travel, if you will, and um, I, I, it, later when we get the opportunity and, and he's, he has the time. He, now, that's the other thing I wanted to get out. Thank you, um, TJ, is that we, those of us that have been involved with some of the deeper subjects, have found ourselves being um, manipulated or in auto accidents or you name it to try to shut us up or put us places where we can't communicate. Now, um, a- Andy was just darn near killed on us, and uh, he's, he's back up now. And I've, I've lost a lot of memory, and a lot of it's um, coming back thanks to people like um, TJ, that have kept all the records as well. Um, Andy is, is um, he, he has a records of the history and events that he took place in as, uh, as a youth as well as um, going up and doing what he's now. So I'm, I'm counting on him being able to, to come forward with me and um, bring some of the secrets and things forward since we've gone beyond the 50-year period of the figure of our society and, uh, and education and science. After 50 years, it should be already public. I think that's their, their attitude. And now we're able to discuss. The biggest problem we have, though, uh, TJ, is that people don't want to believe it. People want to do. They've been watching too much science fiction TV <laughs> to realize that, you know, then they've done a lot of that stuff. So, well, we, we, when I was working for Andy in Project Pegasus before his accident, uh, I talked to him about 1968 Project Pegasus and the CIA time travel experiment, okay? Now, yeah. uh, according to uh, him back in the day, I don't even think he was – I don't know if he was born. And I, I, I should remember because I know later in 1980 he uh, had an interest in it because it wasn't – it was something that uh, several people were offered, including me, uh, through Grumman. Uh, but uh, when I went up there, we went into uh, – There was, I remember where I was in the plane and going in. And, but he uh, – I thought that was Andrew. Uh, so I had my own story that at one time we were going to try to piece together, but we didn't have time in the hotel, you, me, and Andy – we're sitting in because I'm very psychic and uh, we had a lot of women around and I didn't know how, what you were cleared or what he was cleared to remember. And I didn't know how much you would remember. And this was the, uh, we tend to repel each other when we've been uh, working on these things, folks. I know it sounds funny, but they will give you, it's like sodium pentothal, but it's a little type of, uh, thing to make you not really remember you get cloudy brain and then it gets sometimes they'll give you something that at the same time it makes you a little paranoid to talk about it so this is something J. Allen Hynek and I were discussing that I've never told anybody because he wanted to know about my life after life when he met me and he had run out of backing financially for him and was uh, unfortunately we didn't have any money for uh, the Center of UFO Studies at the time, and he was moving from Chicago, where I was, uh, had just been rehired to work on this time travel experiment, but it was time secret because you had to have some remote, it, what they nowadays, they call like remote viewing, but Andy, his father was brilliant and involved in the experiment, but Andy was brilliant as a child. Uh, he was like a child prodigy, and Ken was too, and uh, they choose people. Uh, I can't tell you how they choose people because that's something I'm trying to put together, but we weren't – this is the problem that people started mixing in MK Ultra 
thinking it was the same project. It was not. And Andy and I, years and years ago, would talk on Facebook about we wouldn't put uh, private things. And then he got where he was repelling me, and I knew that he had been altered because some of it he could remember and some he couldn't. And I don't know, Ken, how much of the pieces of the puzzle of uh, Monroe Institute and uh, New Jersey and uh, even Tommy Hawksblood in the uh, New Jersey and could come and go in interdimensional travel and phase spacing. And his associate remembered because in New Jersey they were shutting down. And even then in the 60s through the 80s, you couldn't talk about any of this. So we're going to have to get that book out that we're going to have to write. And I don't know because it may still be where, uh, you know, People are worried when you say CIA, it makes them run the other way. So, you know, it was Andy's father that had uh, some intelligence contract, if I remember correctly, but I don't remember the story. Do you remember his father's story and how he was a candidate uh, to work with, uh, you know, psychic and mo- movement and face spacing? Well, I just, think he called just, it the chrononaut from old books. We had the word chrononaut. Yeah. And, and, Do you and remember any of that? It's just, just very cloudy, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware of what you, you're talking about and that I, I bumped into it. But right now, thanks to the uh, the auto accidents that I've been run through and uh, <laughs> as well as some other things that have been done uh, – you know, and then when you're when you've had to keep your mouth shut for a long time, it's it's hard to dig it back out of your brain <laughs> and see if you still have anything left in there. <clears throat> well, uh, when you're no. in, here's the key: we had to be interested in space and getting to space in any different way that could be done. Well, let me let Richard take over. We're after the hour now, Ken, so we're through. Uh, the first hour, and we can talk again next Saturday. Even Fran may want to come on and reminisce and get some history before you both pass. That's the whole <laughs> reason we do public relations work, especially for our senior citizens and our veterans and our prior government that would like to – anything they feel like they did that now they feel that they can talk about in 2021. And yeah. people like Richards had a huge background, but in order to – He's actually worked out of country and uh, has a security clearance. But, Richard, I think it's time now for you to see what we've all been talking about. But we're getting into some sketchy black water, so to speak, and we're going to work through that in a book. Richard, would you like to help Ken and I write this part of our story before we pass? Well, certainly. I mean, you know, there's a lot of information, like you said, that basically should be passed the Secrecy Act. Um, because the 50-year standard has, you know, gone behind, gone gone to the past anyway. Uh, but it's probably only recent, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, if we're talking in the 60s, then, of course, it's well past, um, you know, even 69 to now. I mean, you know, that's 31, that's 52 years. So anything from 69 and in that gamut from 67 to 69 was, of course, a great many experiments, as well as, of course, landing on the moon in 69 itself, which was, of course, photographed and presented on national television. And that whole uh, project, you know, of uh, Buzz Aldrin and everybody else, and including Ken, I'm sure, at least Ken was the ground troop that I guess you could say promoted everything to the, to the extent of getting all the samples out to the scientists and everything else. So that what would be interesting is to know if, in fact, you know, what they found from the samples themselves. And I'm sure that, again, this is going to be somewhat foggy memory because it's been so darn long ago. But, again, you know, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of hypotheses in regards to the moon itself. I mean, some people have speculated that there may, may, in fact, actually be a space station of some kind on the dark side of the moon that's been there for thousands of years possibly and it's run by alien and alien technology and they've been monitoring our earth you know us here on earth and then when you get into the the projects of like uh interdimensional travel or time travel um 
I don't know a whole great deal about that particular as far as, you know, what, what our government has or hasn't done. <laughs> of course, there are uh, hypotheses in regards to the secret space program between Earth and Mars. Um, I have heard, I've read a, one particular book. I don't recall now who the author was, but they suggested that we, in fact, have uh, what you would call uh, resources on Mars in regards to special forces being stationed there so that in the advent that if at some future point if we are ever invaded by aliens per se we would have the resources to combat such an such an invasion um so there's a whole lot of hypotheses but the question is you know how much of this has actually gone on and if in fact we can support the data by either research or actual factual reports or actual factual projects that went on. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, well, that's been the problem. Now, let me tell you this also. Both of you may remember, because I had a large uh, working in uh, as a hospital corpsman, but they, I was also a security manager. And for, uh, I always worked directly for the commanding officer in any group I was with, including, you know, out west, so to speak. But... Uh, I was privileged to remember when other people were not, and I don't know what that's about because some of mine even – I remember in Area 51 when I flew in from to Las Vegas, Karen Airport, and some gentlemen were pushing uh, – there were people getting on the bus. We had a Janet Airline in the bus, but this uh, these people came up to me and were pointing to me and – I don't, uh, I, they quashed it. So I wondered because I had stories from other people that had seen me with men in black. And I know I did work with men in black from time to time. So that was good for entertainment, but it was also the truth. Now, Andrew, when I, I really do believe that was Andrew Bishago, but because he would never talk to me, I mean, we talked. Okay, don't get me wrong, folks. He gave me his business card and we talked. You know, he's a, a verified as an investigator of editing. He is a Washington uh, bona fide with the uh, Bar Association. Now, he was born September 18th, 1861. So uh, I don't know what that would make him now, but I was there in 68, 9, and see, Jim, 1961. Not 1861, in 1961. <laughs> did I say 1861? Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Making the man over 100, well, almost 200 years old. I mean, <laughs> there you go. 160 okay, years old. Well, let's speculate that that was a Freudian slip because <laughs> I know things. So, Richard, uh, let's speculate that maybe he really is a time traveler, and I – was involved, but they made him where he was scared to talk to me because he talked to me when he didn't know I had any experience back when he didn't know who I was. Somehow he built up a shield where he didn't want to talk to me, even though we would be in a group. And I had to go prove that to myself as a human, a carbon-based unit, right? A sentient intelligent being in the 3D world because face spacing folks and in this fifth dimensional plane that we exist in where uh, we call it the great year with the uh, 24,900 some say 2,500 based on where the sun and the solar system is in the uh, way that we travel in space Andrew and I and Ken had an open mind and we could be recruited to think because we wanted to go to space. We were little kids, and Ken, you put it out there that like we wanted to do Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, and all that, and we watched it on TV. So yes, we, well. were, we were uh, easily influenced as children, but I was 16 or 17, and when uh, Janet Carol Lesson, a friend of mine from back in the day and not uh, doing spiritual and metaphysical community, and she finally got me and Andy together, and I showed Andy my Pegasus tattoo 
which I wasn't supposed to get, but I didn't want to forget. And then uh, because uh, they and they did the same thing with the Ascension. They made uh, oh what do they call them? Uh, made it like a laughing stock. They turn it into propaganda and take what's real if it gets out and make it movies and like with Stan Lee and he followed me on UFO Digest, you know, super soldier stuff, but they don't know with propaganda. That's what I would like you guys to remember. Did Ken, did you in your at Pensacola or or Richard in your National Army National Guard I'd had propaganda training. Meaning we go in and we watch films like National Archive or whatever, but they would teach us how some people are used in the government to spread false truths. So we learned the difference between information, disinformation, and misinformation. And then I became an investigator later and then a journalist. And But they said I was in a special program. They weren't allowed, and I had Surveillance Intelligence Reconnaissance, SIR. But Ken, do you remember having anything on? Do you know what I'm talking about? Did you were you educated in propaganda? Just just a little bit. We we did have a set of meetings where we were we were told um, how not to um, discuss things outside of meetings and and the people that we were working directly with. So yes, I I, I can concur that what you're saying is true. Although uh, and the fact that we are now 50 years <laughs> past it. <laughs> you know, so hopefully all those little guys on those black suits, and those complete black suits and things like that, that we don't have to worry about them trying to find us because they're probably all gone by now. Let's hope so. Well, I didn't get to tell him my story. <clears throat> I tried to, but uh, this was before uh, when we were just, you know, friends here and there. And uh, the time travel part got him really uh Actually, it made me wonder because Andy was out being treated in public relations and television like uh, he he's brilliant speaker. Everybody loves him as a human, and even me because it was so unbelievable at the time, but he was speaking at half-truth. And so I think he was out looking for his own memories because I believe some of it was – when they give that to you, I'm sure it's still in your subconscious, as uh, I can remember. But now there's parts I can't remember because when I went through, I was a, uh, I had to go back through, and the government and the men in black and everybody met me, and the a real tall Navy people came to get me, and they took me to the goat locker for the second time for rehire. But when I went, people seemed to know me going at. Orlando through Navy uh, second time, and the boot, the lady that had made me platoon leader, I was the only one out of 85 women that could call cadence, which was odd considering in my mind I'd never been in the military. And then uh, she told, showed me a painting I drew. I was an artist. She knew I was a Thurmond, and she said, Do, what have they done to you? Do, you don't remember painting this? Because it was a secret, she took me out of, away from everybody and showed me the painting, and that they tore all that down. But it was something to do with all of that from 1967 and eight, and then he was uh, Andy was 1961. So I felt sorry for him because I felt like he was that little boy, and. Uh, uh, maybe he is a time traveler. Who's to say uh, it doesn't exist? I'm not. I'm not excluding it because I've been out there sharing past lives and died in this reality. So, in my reality, Ken, I'm trying to put together the spiritual path with life after life, and you know the Monroe Institute and all of that. Uh, how we can uh, travel and go into dreams and then have lucid dreams and then do uh, what the kids are really doing on TikTok now, and they talk about it. They're not awake and they're not asleep, but they're doing their own self-hypnotism. But it will also, if they just relax, they can get to that other part of who we are. And so we're really sort of asleep, even though we're saying we're awake. So I believe the Ascension Age Awakening is really about us learning not only about our conscious level, that I'm talking to you in now are, are beta alpha theta, right? You know, the 
the, there's the conscious, the subconscious, superconscious, and then how we pass over in our ascension way, and we can get on the other side and learn how to return over and over as incarnations. And I can go into that. That's going to be a whole story in ascension in our book. But Richard, can you help me out here with Ken? Because Ken and I have a long history, and it's people that believe in synchronicity and serendipity may think, well, these people have met each other a long time ago and come back around again. I believe it's for a reason, Ken, and that there's no coincidence that I'm here in Pensacola where you went to Naval uh, well, I went to Naval Air Base. Uh, you know, I went to – actually, I learned to fly. <laughs> and uh, I was at uh, Hickam, and uh, I went out to Hawaii, and uh, I've got all kinds of stories to tell if anybody wants to listen. Richard, help us out here. Can you see how people cross paths for a reason? And this is what we're going to be writing this next book about, that and time travel. Go ahead, Richard. Sure. You understand? Um, I mean – yeah, I mean, basically, you could say that on a spiritual level, I do believe that uh, we sort of set a contract between ourselves and the source of all or God or whatever you want to call them, the power that that, that is beyond our reasoning anyway, that sustains us all. Um, I do believe that uh, even before we're born or incarnated into the life that we're currently living, we actually set points in those in our lives where we will meet certain given individuals and it's, it's like an, uh, an appointment that gets met. And then, you know, uh, you go on after that particular meeting and you live a, a bit more life and you have a few more experiences and what have you. And then all of, all of a sudden you come back and you meet again. It's almost like uh, you come together to validate everything that you've experienced in a manner of speaking, because you've been in similar experiences or similar situations and environments and worked in certain circumstances, especially including the government. Uh, and so it's like you come back together to share stories and the stories basically are mainly truthful, but at the same time, they're a little bit shadowy simply because, you know, uh, there's been what you would call mental interference simply because you, you've got the government on one hand saying, okay, well, we want you to do all this. And it's all good, and, you know, it's all for the benefit of the nation and so forth. And yet at the same time, they're, they're telling you, well, we really don't want you to remember what you've done. Now, of course, uh, there's regressive <laughs> therapy, and there's also very deep hyp hypnosis science that can actually bring back those or bring forth those memories that have even been uh, solution or chemically removed or chemically subdued, I guess you would say. And this had been proven, uh, and I'll relate this particular story. I don't remember exactly the town, okay, because actually, in actuality, this has probably happened a great many times all over the United States. And I say this simply because I saw a film, and I say this also because I read a book, and there were uh, a, a, couple of, a couple that were psychologists and a psychotherapist, okay, and they went to this very small town, which I think had a population of about 180 people, all right? This town had been visited by extraterrestrials, all right? And uh, the, this had gone on for probably about a month's time. And evidently, I guess the government, could say, you could say, took notice of it because the men in black were involved. And also uh, the couple were sent there specifically to hypnotize and record any of the experiences that these particular townspeople or villagers happened to recall. And... They went through and they hypnotized, I want to say, about 20 or 30 people. And like I said, this was a very small town, maybe population, maybe 150 at the most, something like that. Anyway, the ironic thing was that as they delved into and got more and more information of these people recalling actual, <clears throat> you know, face-to-face -face encounters with extraterrestrials, the more they uh, revealed on tape and it was recorded and so forth, uh, the more it was like fear began to run through the town. Um, it, it's like, you know, these people suddenly uh, began to realize that, hey, I'm not alone, that I've actually experienced this and that these aliens are alive and well and they've come to visit us and so forth. 
and it ended in absolute tragedy because uh, the the experiment was shut down, and all of a sudden there were uh, a great deal of suicides that happened in that particular town. In other words, these people became so fearful of having brought back into their consciousness these actual alien encounters that they, they, they were afraid that, you know, the, the aliens were still there or the aliens were watching them or the aliens might come back and so on and so forth. And the result was, unfortunately, a great many suicides. Well, this has a lot of interesting facts in it in the fact being that, you know, paranoia, of course, is the fear of the unknown. And that's the basis of it. And anytime you're talking any kind of fear, the normal reaction is either the flight or fright. The fight or flight syndrome, which we are kind of programmed human beings from that perspective, and this is this is kind of in our our animal or base brain, and so you either are going to fight, in other words, repel uh, and even destroy or even murder whatever it is you don't know, um, which of course has been a great theme through a great many horror movies and monster movies all over uh, history, and that or you may just decide that you want to turn and run from it. And this uh, is brought up in this particular scenario because these people, once they realized that what they had thought was just a dream that in fact became a reality, that it actually was a real life event that had actually transpired, they became very paranoid. And unfortunately, their paranoia (laughs) ended up in suicide. So uh, that's an extreme, of course. But at the same time, go ahead. No, go ahead. We well, I was, just, I, I was I was just going to say, you know, that that I love our government, uh, you know, and I'm I'm very much a patriot. I, I you know, I'm prior military myself. I prior uh, worked for the government on numerous occasions uh, in regards to law enforcement and other other means, both as a consultant as well as uh, actually sworn law enforcement officer. Um, and I would never do anything that would in any way tamper our government or take away from our government, Um, you know, but at the same time, I have to question, well, why is it, you know, it is obvious that there have been technological advances that were brought about by Area 51. Uh, There there are uh, engines that are, you know, exceedingly fast and exceedingly quiet, and they have the ability to build craft that can hover uh, you know, silently in space and all of these different kind of things. And it's obvious that the technology just kind of left, you know, so you have to wonder and say, well, okay, if this, if this base was so secretive that, you know, the, the fences were marked, you know, trespassers will, if found, will be shot. Uh, you know, in other words, saying very frankly, if you don't belong here, don't come here, period. Um, so that, that cloak of secrecy, of course, spurs the curiosity. And, of course, hundreds of folks have gone there and, and gone on onto the various uh, mountaintops and so forth and take detailed photographs and all of this kind of thing as to what may or may not be going on there. It is also known that, of course, there is a great deal of under, underground tunnels and underground rooms, even to the extent of saying an underground base, per se. Well, you know, uh, we've had all these all these crazy <laughs> movies come forth, and, yes, I would say that movies themselves uh, are not only propaganda, but they are also a sliver of truth because there's a sliver of truth buried in them. And if you watch them carefully enough and you have an open mind, you can say, okay, well, this is plausible, and this may have, have in fact, taken place. And then, of course, you have the, the science fiction addition to it, you know, that, uh, or you have the special effects and all the rest of it. And some of it may be special effects and some of it not. Historically, well, of tell, course. Go ahead. Let, let me tell you something about paperwork because I had uh, my code name was Magic, okay? And my husband that's passed told me not to tell the stories till he passed. Of course, we have some radio shows here on TJ Marcy Radio with history. And some of it I lost was with Stanton T. Friedman. Stanton T. Friedman went to his grave knowing the truth about my husband and I because he interviewed us and talked to us. And because my husband wouldn't agree, he did that. Now, Richard Dolan, also a historian, wanted to come. He called and talked to me. 
But I, my husband, I asked my husband, and he said, no, under no circumstances could Richard Dolan come. Richard said he was in New York. He was in Rochester. He'd be glad to come down to Kentucky and interview us. And he was, my husband said, nope, not till he died. So I got to know Karen, uh, which was Richard's wife. And uh, they've since uh, moved on and had a break of contract. And I believe he's with someone else now. But uh, the point is, there's parts that are out there folks that I know is my truth and I I haven't been out there in the public eye like uh, Andrew Bashago or, or Ken R. Johnston or Ken Johnston but I have pieces that other people that followed my radio show know I have and I'm looking for my truth too I'm a truth seeker and all of us if you listen we're all just wanting the truth and we all have the pieces. So NASA, the CIA, of course, NSA, uh, all the intelligence groups, back now, these kids, we have the computers. Think about how it was for us at your age running the computers now and all the information you have at your fingertips. We didn't have that. So any information in the human form as a carbon-based unit we were threatened to not share, and but we took an oath of office as well. And they would threaten to take our family out to the deserts and you'd never see them or uh, people would disappear. And that's what they used as the tactics in Roswell. And uh, so I'm going to try to do my best to do my duty. <laughs> That sounds like the Girl Scout. I don't know. Did that yeah. sound familiar? We will, we will, I took the oath of office to defend my country against both foreign and domestic enemies, okay? And uh, Ken, you took it and Richard took it because you can't wear a uniform if you don't. Is that – you take That's an oath? Correct. And Absolutely. And so we're not going to lie to you folks. We are part of disclosure as the uh, old UFO groups used to say. Now we're UAP groups, and uh, we've got something coming up June 21st, and it's going to be great. We've got some brilliant scientists coming together to speak about this, and maybe it's going to answer some of Andrew Bashago's questions he always wanted to know. Now, I've seen uh, – I haven't kept up with Andy's story. Uh, 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 one of his friends uh, – half of Lambert Weber and I are still friends – Janet Carol Lesson and I are still friends. Ken R. Johnston and I are still friends. Karen Patrick, I haven't talked to her since she had her before she was with that A.R. Borden name I dropped earlier subconsciously. And I wonder, because 1861, uh, Andy, me and Ken and Richard may have been alive at that time. Because you said 1861. Because uh, may not have been a Freudian slip, and I didn't even know I did it. So that is how I've learned a lot about going and researching at times, saying something that I didn't even know I said, and then go find out it was true. And I wonder how many of you people have gone looking uh, for deja vu feeling or knowing there's something you're missing and you're following because you're part of a soul group and you're part of a team that's come back here to advance humanity. And a lot of you are called wanderers and a lot of you are called travelers. And you may want to look into how Carla Ruckert, who was a physicist at school in University of Kentucky, got with Don Elkins and watched their old 60s and 70s videos. They're still on YouTube, I think. Uh, otherwise, it's in the National Archive. And then watch the man named Anderson that Stanton T. Friedman. I don't remember Anderson's first name, uh, <laughs> maybe it, but – uh, Anderson was one of the boys in the scout troop or a group uh, that came upon the aliens in Roswell, and he told the truth. I know he told the truth, and Stan and I talked about it. So uh, I talked to J. Allen Hynek. I talked to Stan Friedman, and I have not divulged all the information that we knew. Now, is it time? I'm being told, Ken, you know, we can do this. If we want to now, uh, so if you want to meet back here next week, we can do that. And we've got a meetup group 
Now, folks, because we don't know what's truth and what's not, and that is seems to be the theme in Woo Year One <laughs> after 2020, is the fact that a lot of the things that we used to have that we could go and meet each other has shut down. And it's during this time on the planet during Ascension Age where it's said throughout history there is a cleansing and a lot of people leave the planet, Earth, one way or the other. So some people believe in a rapture or their friends will be taken and they won't. Or Some of the Amazon uh, troops or coal cities came and went. And I don't know what all Richard Hoagland believes, but uh, I, I don't even know what Ken believes or Andy Bishago or, well, Andrew, but we call him Andy. And then Richard here goes by Rick, and Rick has said he would be honorary president while we start putting all these pieces of the puzzle together of veterans and uh, non-veterans, the GS people, if you want to come forth. Uh, so, Richard, why don't you talk with that about Ken, a little idea of what we've got going on. And, Ken, you tell us what you think because you've got the high – we told you you're the elder in the group. Other than our ace folk life, we have <laughs> Jack Rutherford. He's 90. <laughs> but you two, I'm going to – I can't mute. I Normally I would mute, but he's on my phone again. Richard, I'll just have to sit here. Go ahead. You two talk about the future. Time travel well, book. Yeah, we've we've got all kinds of book projects that we're doing. Uh, uh, at least a couple with Dr. Rick Allen Miller, um, who's a great uh, mind and a, a brilliant person, individual, and he's writing books about time travel and uh, ET experiences and the Men in Black and all this kind of thing. And of course, uh, TJ and myself are going to put together a book on the Men in Black. And, you know, you're welcome to add chapters to the same or to add chapters into any of the works if you so choose, Ken. I mean, I realize that, you know, uh, this fog that you're in at the moment is slowly but surely lifting. I mean, even when you look out and you see fog in the morning, it, it lingers around until the sun hits it. And when the light comes on, of course, the fog goes away. So, um, but, yeah, we're... we're we're writing all kinds of books and intend to publish, you know, more. Uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Miller's publishing stamp will be on uh, his, of course, and then we, we will also be using TJ's publishing stamp on ours. Um, and, of course, we also have cre recreated ACO, which is, you know, the American Communications Online, and it is a humongous umbrella that just has so many groups. I can't, I can't even keep track of them all. And, yes, I've stepped forward as president on a volunteer basis, and I'm trying to organize all these things. And we have to reach out now and find out exactly how many groups are still active, how many, you know, how many have actual leaders that will step forward and say, okay, this is who we are and this is what projects we're running and everything else. So, like she said, we're, we're in a manner of speaking, putting together this grandiose puzzle, and we don't know what all the pieces hold yet because we're still in the in the research and reach out process but at the same time we're also putting together books um like i said uh, men in black uh anything ar about ufo's or aliens um anything in regards to uh paranormal experiences any kind of uh near death experiences um because you know TJ and I have both died and come back um and you've probably so come close to it yourself yep so see that that may be the reason we're we're all coming together now, you see, because when you get older spirits that have been on the planet for a while and have had a lot of different experiences that are very unusual in nature, it's very, very important to get that information out there so that in turn, those folks that have just, you know, the younger ones that have just been born in the last 20, 30 years may have already encountered such experiences themselves and they're running around kind of dazed because they don't have the understanding spiritually as to what those experiences entailed or uh, how real they were, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, you know, you get into all, all kinds of topics with dreaming and hypnosis and, and metaphysics itself. I mean, metaphysics is, is like a, a, a serious umbrella as well. I mean, you have all kinds of topics in metaphysics, 
Uh, you've got, you know, everything that's paranormal, everything that's supernatural, everything that's spiritual to some extent, everything that's uh, out of the ordinary, everything that, that's involved in uh, the esoteric, everything that's involved in the occult, everything that is in hidden traditions or hidden knowledge or historical uh, volumes that uh, take place, you know, regarding traditions and so forth. And, of course, then you have all kinds of initiatory paths, and you have shamanism, and you have uh, faith healing, and you have um, energetic healing, and you have integrative medicine, which is kind of a combination of, it's not medicine as, you know, applied or recognized by the AMA, because, of course, we're not practicing medicine, and we're certainly not doctors in the physical realm, but we're metaphysicians, so we're doc we're doctors of metaphysics, and from that aspect, uh, that's, you know, what we're bringing together. So I don't know what you feel that you would like to uh, attribute or contribute, uh, Ken. Ken, let me, uh, can, can yeah, let me tell you real quick with Andy. Andy doesn't have to accept my truth any more than you do, right? But I want you to know, Ken, uh, while you get to know me and Richard uh, on this show, that there's no reason for us to lie. You know, we only want to tell the truth. And uh, I told Janet about a little boy that was up there in, uh, like, New Jersey area, but we were also all around Montauk Point and Long Island. But I'm just putting my story together, too, right? So Janet was bringing people on the radio. So I don't know why Andy – Andy was so sweet to me and good, and we had a great time together together. You know, when you and I met in Mars Conference in 2017. So I just wanted to tell you that my husband and I had a Mars story, and I knew in my DNA that part of us, you know, we were during a, a war in uh, Mars, and so we remembered in our past lives, but we also worked in Andromeda Galaxy outside of M31. So all these stories go together. I don't know if that fits in with your Mars or story or his Mars story, but people have it in their DNA that think we all have a memory of some part of us coming from Mars, but some of us say the Pleiadians and Anunnaki had a big war too. Now, Ken, go ahead. How how can you go forward with you and I think Andy's a part of your story, Ken. I do. Okay. Well, I, I guess the only, the, it becomes a lot easier when you finally uh, feel comfortable with being able to explain things that you have, have had come back to you in your life. And I mean, I have, um, some people say, that, well, I had this dream, I dreamed this, or I dreamed that. Whenever you've had uh, repeats and things, and you start realizing that uh, some of the stuff that's coming back forward in your mind could well be very true events. So don't be, don't, well, Again, you've got to figure out, if you're supposed to go out there and kill everybody, I think you probably get the wrong part of the brain working. We always talk about learning and educating and discovering what we've been a part of, either in just this life or in past lives, because I also have, uh, as yourself, have been involved in, in the past life um, re-education, if you will. So and it, it's a real comforting feeling to know that we're able now to talk about these things publicly and that uh, it allows other people that are listening to what we've been talking about, taking a big, deep breath and saying, finally, I've found the family. And here we are, here willing to help anybody who wants to talk about it and uh, we can connect them with the people. That, they may find out that they're, some of their relatives or they may discover they have new relatives, people that have been involved before. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to um, to make our lives more comfortable with knowing the truth and that's all you can search for is so let's just stick with the truth we 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 we're, we're say although we we may be trying to be shut down like they've been trying to do to me for a while i'm sure they've done the same to you uh, TJ. so let's let's stick together we are stronger when we are together that's about the best i can say Oh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> well, well, also, Ken, Ken, I would also like to offer that in our meetup group that we just formed, uh, 
and we paid for six months in advance. We put on there because Fran, your wife, is is really intelligent about all this, and she doesn't know what we know in our heads any more than we know what's in hers. But she said just to be safe because, you know, we're going to go and see. You're fading out, TJ. Yeah, I lost you. Oh. Well, I'm saying that you never know if people are going to believe you or not, but you can't worry about it anymore, right? There's going to be people that believe and don't. So we've got the science fiction we can write, too, for those maybe that want to share writing skills and are very involved with Philip K. Dick or Isaac Asimov or any of those, or even Tom Clancy in military. But uh, we can base science fiction that say it's based on truth, based on true story, but put the speculation. So it's just a starting that. Uh, Richard, did you know I put science fiction on there? Yes, I noted that, TJ. Oh, okay. What's your... <laughs> yeah, science I don't fiction know if writers can... was a wide category or whatever. Well, that's because of the Mid-South Con and when we went science fiction and the government was looking uh, in my realm of uh, paranormal desk, as the FBI said, uh, as long as it's on the paranormal desk, you know, but, uh, you know, the CIA also looked, did papers on, uh, I think it was Robert Monroe, Monroe Institute, and that was released. And that's out there in the CIA files. But don't be scared about intelligence, folks, because the Internet Everything is monitored. They can. The, the government started this with the universities, and we go. I used to write the history. All this. I got books with the history of internet, history of the Roswell story. It's all. I've told my truth here and there, and putting it together. But uh, uh, I worked with some very well-known people, and they kept. They knew the truth, but they kept it secret. You'd be surprised at how many people know the truth, and have kept it from the public, even the entertainers and the one that have signed up on IMDb, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Linda Bolton. I don't know if Linda Bolton Howe's on there or not, but uh, anyway, we'll just do our best to help you folks. It doesn't matter if it's your truth or if you just want to be a science fiction writer was all I was saying, because I think Philip K. Dick was sharing his experiences and he changed the world. But when me and my husband saw that total recall we were in the middle of a major investigation for President Ronald Reagan uh, back in the day, and we both had hip pocket orders, and we were talking stuff that we weren't supposed to talk, and we repelled each other just like me and Andrew Bashaga repelled each other again. It was weird. It's like we weren't supposed to be together. But five years later, he and I got married, and we owned our truth, and we lived happily ever after till he passed on. And that's a whole story too, Ken. So I hear you. I hear you, Richard. Richard, you and you and Ken are doing a good job. So now it's just a part of can we sustain and be persistent and being open to the public? Does that make sense? Yes, it does to me, and it gives the other people the opportunity to know that they can come forward and uh, deal with us that have been through what they, they're going through and uh, being able to have someone to discuss it with them so they realize that they're not crazy. They haven't lost their mind. They, they may have been manipulated a little bit, but then um, that's all part of uh, men in black and what, what they've been trying to do. But uh, our job now is, and, and you, you, you hit a spike on it in that we are now in the point of, of disclosure and it's time for full disclosure. And the best way to do it is as a team and, and a force and that's what we are, just so long as we're together. So I'm I'm very thankful that you got back in touch with me, TJ. We we were pretty much of a team a long time ago, knew each other, but then it you know we we had to we had to <clears throat> cross paths in in history, and now we're ready to bring it all back together and make it make it real for other people well, can, can join. Doctor Richard Allen Miller is a publishing folks is a good friend of ours. I did a through the years here on radio with him and he said don't forget carol rosen and her part because she came forward in a time when it wasn't really acceptable 
and uh, told us that there could be a false flag, you know, because uh, Eric von Braun knew more than he was telling about extraterrestrials. But we all did, even at NASA. So, you know, Chris Kraft hired my husband. And I know he probably heard the tapes before my husband had to delete or take him out. I don't know what they did because we used to do what we were told to do, but uh, just like Ken did. So we'll get into that in, in one of these virtual webinars. We're calling them World Science Webinars. But I'm just telling you, uh, Dr. Rick Allen Miller, GS18, uh, loyal trained a lot of the SEALs, and he did the uh, PSYOPs and psychic uh, training a lot like May the Force Be With You <laughs> in Star Trek and uh, before Gene Roddenberry started Star Trek and all that uh, in the day. And I was all a part of watching all of that. And I remember them telling me, always keep grounded and anchored and follow your heart, but also follow your gut. They call it your other brain. And this was an intelligence and uh, all the psychic stuff we learned. And we learned about being old souls that come back and have soul groups in uniform and out of uniform to protect our planet. So as far as I'm concerned, we've got extraterrestrials, alien civilizations exist and a lot of people believe we are stars. We are stardust. We have starseed groups. I have some myself. I've been made fun of by some guy that was made uh, back in the day in 2007 or so because I mentioned starseed on UFO Digest. So, you know, it's hard to come out and tell the truth of what you think. But I, now people say it scientifically. <laughs> but my daughter told me she was out hanging stars. She was out with the stars when she came and she came and said she was going to help cure cancer. And my husband said the same thing. And my husband said, we gave the government, the army, a cure for cancer and they couldn't use it because of big pharma. And I may get thrown off of the internet from now on. Cause I just <laughs> <laughs> a lot of power there, <laughs> but you know, the truth will set us free. So maybe we do, maybe we don't, but mm -hmm. you know what, there's so many types, but I have a, I have a voice. I'm a woman. I'm a veteran, and I had lost my daughter. So that comes from a concern of how she was an other. She didn't get to be a boy or a girl. She got to be an other. And there's a long. And she had four children live. She had twelve children, but only four lived. So her son, she wrote a book called Intrinsic Reality, and I've started this church in her honor of her going through life and death and me watching her go through life and death. So you can say that this could be hell or the prison planet with some people that tell me that, and there's days that you may think that, but there is a God and there's a good side because my daughter never lost hope or faith, and she couldn't even... I mean, they literally killed her in this cancer, Moffitt Cancer Center, and they will tell you that how that goes. And there were Nordics there. The Nordics were part of the plan and helped them come back. But they killed all – the first thing to go is the inside of your mouth, like thrush, if you've ever had it. Your tongue goes white, and it's all the soft – tissue down your throat into your esophagus and down to your stomach it swells up burns can't eat and basically they give you a whole new birth date so she went january 27th 1974 and then may i believe it was may 16th 2017 was her new gave her a new birth date in this reality she died and came back but she didn't live much longer she was one of the test results for cancer and um, AML was uh, – anyway, I'll stop there because that needs to be a story told too. You can look her up on uh, YouTubes with me, and she told her story here at Navarre Conference Center uh, with her – she had to wear a mask and gloves before all of us did in 2020. So there was a whole extraterrestrial story about all of that, whether y'all believe it or not. Back to you, Richard and Ken. <laughs> You got it first, Richard. Well, the thing of it is, you know, for the last 50,000 years, probably more, uh, 
aliens, alien persons or alien entities, whatever you want to call them, have been living among us for a very, very long time. Uh, they have interjected themselves sometimes technologically, sometimes just, uh, you know, to observe us, sometimes to interact with us, sometimes, you know, and then again, you know, uh, I myself, uh, I know for a fact that I've been here thousands of times. I also know that uh, I don't, I am not a native of the earth, that I actually am a being that, you know, is from a far, far, far away place, and I have many lifetimes on other planets and other galaxies and all of this kind of thing. And again, you know, hey, if you want to look at it as science fiction, look at it as science fiction. That's fine with me. The fact of the matter remains is that this is a tremendous commonality among thousands and possibly even millions of people at the present moment. They identify, they, they suddenly reawaken or get memories back that tell them, hey, you know, okay, why is it I have never felt like I fit here? Why is it I have always felt like, you know, kind of not an outcast per se, but just didn't quite fit into the groove of everybody else? And, of course, uh, there are all kinds of dreams, uh, all kinds of out-of-body experiences, uh, near-death experiences. Uh, I mean, I personally have had what you would call, I guess, precognitive dreams where the dream warns you of a specific event that's going to transpire. And in this particular instance, it was a wreck that would have killed me if I had not had the foreknowledge of avoiding the wreck. And I was driving a pickup truck. I was a courier at the time. And I come around a hairpin turn in this one particular road, and there happened to be what you'd call like a, a pause space or a temporary rest space or whatever that was a big piece of dirt off to the side. And uh, I was forewarned by a dream twice, and then the third time it showed me where I basically died. In other words, this uh, other vehicle was coming around the hairpin turn going excessively fast, and would have actually done a head-on collision with me. And fortunately, because I was forewarned, when the day actually occurred, I parked in that space to the side, and the vehicle came around the hairpin turn and went on its way, and I sat there safe and alive. So you could say that dreams can actually save your life. I mean, you have premonitions where, you know, you, you are going to get on a plane and all of a sudden something tells you, no, 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 I don't need to leave right now. And you go back and you change the ticket. And unfortunately, you learn maybe an hour or two later that something drastically wrong happened with the plane. Maybe it exploded or had an engine explode or went out of control or something and, and <laughs> actually crashed. Um all kinds, you know, there's all kinds of experiences that we have that we just keep to ourselves simply because we think they're too crazy to share because then in turn the opinions of others would turn against us. Well, what other people think really has no bearing on us anymore, okay? I mean, yeah, I'm 65 years old. I mean, you know, I've seen a lot, lived a lot, um, you know, and our friend Andy is at least 60 and probably will be turning 61 this year. So he's the young and amongst us of the of the four of us anyway, whereas of course Ken is our our elder commander over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm working hard at it too. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, you know, we we cannot say specifically whether something really really happened or not. When you think of it. Uh, uh, from an aspect of reality, from a psychological perspective, okay? Reason would tell you, okay, we go to sleep at night and we have dreams. And in these dreams, we have all kinds of exotic events and all kinds of travels and all kinds of things that occur. And then we wake up and we go about our regular business, you know, whether you're doing a nine to five job or eight to four job or whatever it happens to be or whatever your specialty happens to be. And then, of course, once you get off work, you go and relax with friends or you visit with family, et cetera, et cetera. Who is to say or who is can, can actually come down and say that, okay, your waking state is more your actual reality than your dream state is when you're asleep? 
Why? Because uh, the brain waves are still active. You know, our imagination uh, and and so forth is, is still very active as well. Not to mention our five senses. And of course, if you lucid dream, where you actually go in and you take control of the dream itself, and you actually have a hand in creating the events that you're experiencing while you're dreaming, who's to say that that's not actually something you're doing in live form? whether it be here on Earth in another country or whether it be somewhere else on another planet or whether it be on a spaceship that's floating around in the atmosphere somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. It's it just, you know, it's very, very interesting to explore the dream state and to, because there seems to be a very fine line between when we're dreaming and when we're astral traveling or when we're having an out-of-body experience because they all seem to, to function from the aspect being that our mind and our bodies are in a relaxed state. And then in turn, it's like our consciousness leaves our physical selves and goes on them, these adventures and meanderings, wherever it happens to be, and all of this kind of thing. And then we come back to the body and, you know, we're saying, well, did that really happen? And uh, of course, you know, I've, I was legally dead for 33 minutes at the age of 14, and I can tell you for ex for a fact exactly what all went on in the operation and everything else. But unfortunately, when I got to the other side and, and behold, beheld the face of God more or less, or at least what I thought would be God at 14, I was told that well, there are many things you haven't accomplished yet, and you got to go back. And, of course, I asked God, well, do me one favor. And he says, sure, what's that? And I said, well, I would like to see who and what I actually am. And for somehow or some reason, uh, he granted this. And basically, before I went back down the tunnel of multicolors, which a lot of people have been through that, um, I was allowed consciously to step out of my existence, I guess you could say, or my form of existence, and I was shown that I was nothing but a swirling ball of light that had consciousness. And so if that's the fact, okay, and again, this is only my opinion because this is what I living through, I lived through this experience. In other words, I was completely dead, all right? When I came back down into my body, my body was covered in, on, on a sheet, and the nurse was applying a tag to my toe. So, I mean, you know, and then I sat up and the nurse screamed and fainted. Fortunately, there was another nurse in the room because the good doctor had never sewed me closed. So, but anyway. We're out of time, you know, so we'll we'll have to pick up our life after lives, which a lot of y'all know I've died and come back during childbirth and all of that. Ken has too, so that'll be another life well, after life. Now, Ken, I want to put on this show, because we're out of time, we're actually off the clock, but I have seen and this is in this reality, people stop moving, just like in the Adjustment Bureau with Philip K. Dick, folks, the movie. I've seen it. It's real, and it can be done. And that is like in Men in Black where they took the little thing and said, watch here, and they hypnotized you. Well, that's one way, but there's another way. And some people's minds do it anyway. I just hope you'll look into it and look for that where maybe you see uh, you have, uh, well, we won't go there right now, but I've seen a woman in bed where she was talking. They took, uh, and her brain just stopped and for a few minutes and then she came right back where she left off, you know, as a hospital corpsman or training and in intelligence Two or three minutes later, she picks it up right back up. So, y'all, there's YouTubes about what I'm talking. I'm not making this stuff up. It's just that you haven't experienced it or haven't heard about it or haven't had your mind opened. And I'm telling you, there's things that we're going to talk about in the future that are real in science. And I, I guess you guys are going to call it pseudoscience, so we'll have to see. But we're journalists. We're storytellers, and you are author of your own life story. So, folks, uh, Ken Johnston is Mars One Astronaut, spelled out O-N-E, Mars One Astronaut at gmail.com. And we ask our writers to use Gmail. Richard is RT Knight 35, that's Knight with a K, at Gmail. I am... T.J. Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, 
agency at gmail.com. And the three of us have started a meetup group. We hope to meet you in the future in person if we live that long. And if not, then meet us back here on the radio next Saturday. Ken, will you be back here next Saturday? If the uh, Lord yeah. willing. If the Lord wills it, I'll be available. Uh, Richard, I know I couldn't chase him away with a fork, could I, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's let's do this. Now, tomorrow, Richard and I will be back here, and Ken, you're allowed to come on Sunday and help us with uh, our spiritual talks that we do talk about out of body and near death and all that, and uh, you're it's four to six, so folks. So Ken, for you, that is you're one hour behind me. So that would be three to five on Sunday tomorrow, if you can remember to call in. I'll make a note of that before you feed the horses. <laughs> My friend, friend already did all of that. <laughs> well, I'm talking tomorrow, Sunday. Okay. If you want to call, if you want to call in and talk about the future book of near death experiences on Sunday tomorrow, we're going to talk about spirituality and uh, with Richard T. Knight and maybe Gigi. You'll get to meet Gigi. She's a screenwriter and an author as well. So uh, we've got these authors doing out of body, near death, life after life. It'll be an interesting show, folks. All right. Love and light, everybody. Thank you, Ken. You did an excellent job. I hope we didn't embarrass you too much. And I look forward to uh, talking to you. Hopefully tomorrow, on, on uh, if Richard can get you, he'll call you and wake you up from your nap, probably. <laughs> there you go. Well, I really enjoyed working with both of you guys and look forward to uh, tomorrow for the future. And for all the people that want to join in on us and pick up where they may have left off. Very good point. It's been a whole year, yes. folks. So uh, we'll try to do it again. All right. And I'll send you a snapshot, Ken, of you writing to your friend, your best friend, and all that, and ACO and all that. Love and light, everybody. All right. Thank you. Love Thank and you, light. Everybody. Good night. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Bye bye. I'm trying to push the button to get some music going here. Anything will do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, end of...